last talk in this session is given by uh, Tobias Megendorfer uh, on value iteration for long run average reward in Markov decision processes. Okay, this, yeah, this, this works. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, this is joint work uh, with uh, Pranav, who's here in the audience, uh, Krish, Przemek, and my supervisor, Jan. Uh, let's jump right into it, because, yeah, lunch is coming close. Um, first, I'm going to tell you about what you have to expect and why you should pay attention. Um, so what we're trying to solve uh, in the paper is the problem of long-run average reward on MDPs using value iteration. Some of you may know long-run average reward under the name of mean payoff or limit average reward, and there exists a gazillion of names for it. So, uh, and it's also actually a quite old problem, but it turns out that uh, value iteration approaches actually only exist for subclasses, but not for the general problem. So we just try to tackle that. So what we did uh, is we um, disproved, we have disproven uh, actually a conjecture made by Putemann like 20 years ago uh, related to that. We provide a general solution and we use ideas from machine learning to get a drastic performance increase while still maintaining um, accuracy. Okay, so first introduction, uh, MDPs, probably most of you know them, uh, standard model for actors in randomized environments. Um, how do they look like in math? Oh, yeah, we can see this. Uh, they have states. In the states, you can choose an action, and, and then they, uh, with some probability, they take you somewhere. On the right side, you see the toy example that will accompany us through the talk. And actually, it's quite literally a toy example because it's the uh, accurate model of the Dancertron 3000 made by Tom Industries. Um, and it can do various things. So it's a small robot designed for dancing and entertaining people. And so what it can do is it, well, it can dance. And then it goes to this dancing uh, state and dances for you. And uh, when, when it finishes, like when it finishes the dancing, it does a super cool move that's really impressive. Uh, it can also do backflip from, from the starting state. And well, so the people were actually pretty lazy when, Im when implementing it. When it uh, succeeds doing the backflip, it just stands there. Why were they lazy? Because, yeah, most of the time the, the thing tries to do the backflip and just falls down to the ground and can't stand up. Uh, the same with this, uh, when it stops dancing, it might fall down and then it lies on the, on the ground and the only thing it can do is kind of wiggle its hands and, yeah, they were too lazy to implement a stand-up routine, so, yeah, that's about what it can do. Um, okay. So, and the next thing we add to MDPs are rewards. In this case, uh, it will be my personal entertainment when watching the robot doing its things. So um, when it's dancing, I'm kind of OK with it. Uh, when it does its flashy finisher move, I'm like super impressed. Well, how can it do that? Uh, the backflip is just permanent amazement. Like if it, if it tries it, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty impressed already. And if it succeeds in doing, I'll be eternally impressed. And this is like the biggest reward you can get in the long run here. And if it's fallen to the ground and wiggles around its arms, then I'm also pretty, uh, uh, like, I find that pretty funny. Just imagine like a tor tortoise lying on its back and, and uh, uh, like wiggling its arms. Pretty funny, I think. Yeah. Okay. So what's the next thing we need? We need strategies. We've seen that already, uh, also named schedulers or something. It basically tells you uh, what the thing does. Just imagine the uh, program that governs what the robot does. In, in the talk here, we'll only consider um, state-dependent actions, so uh, state-dependent strategies, sorry, um, that basically are strategies that tell you for each state what I'm going to do. So as an example, consider the strategy that uh, tells you start dancing, then immediately stop dancing. And if you're on the ground, then, then yeah, do your thing. And then it kind of looks like this. So I've grayed out all the unimportant stuff. And when we completely remove it, 
hey, this looks kind of familiar. This is a Markov chain. So what do we have? If we um, have an MDP, add a strategy to it, we get a Markov chain. And we know things about Markov chains. So for Markov chains, there also is this concept of long-run average reward, and it's quite literally the expected reward you get in the long run. So um, it has an interesting interpretation. You can think of it as average energy consumption, as some kind of performance metric. My average enjoyment while or entertainment while watching this robot do its do its particular program. Okay, so here's the math. I'm not going to go into that. Um, it's known how to solve this. You can do linear equations, whatever. Um, for this particular strategy, notice that eventually the robot will fall down on the ground and then do its floor moves. And so I'll basically uh, we get five reward on average here. Um, and the, like the, the finite prefix doesn't matter because we only look at the limit. Okay, so what we've seen is with an MDP and a strategy, we get a Markov chain. If we have a Markov chain, we get this long run average reward thingy. So in a more abstract sense, we take something, we take an MDP, we throw something at it, we get out a number. We can optimize this. So that's what we try to do. We try to find an optimal strategy which, optim yeah, which optimizes the long-run average reward. Um, for the sake of simplicity, we'll only consider the maximal like ma um, reward maximization. Um, but you can also do it with minimizations, completely the same. Okay, you can solve that by using uh, by posing a linear program and then running simplex on it, which has polynomial time, uh, in theory. But in practice, it just doesn't work for anything. So what you can do is use dynamic programming approaches like value iteration, uh, which is like takes an exponential amount of steps in the worst case, but in practice, it's just way faster. OK, so how does it work? What's quite easy to get is the end step average reward. You literally just do Bellman style updates. Um, and what's also quite obvious, I guess, is that um, if you just average this end step optimal reward, then you get the end step average reward. Okay, so now that we to, to get the uh, long run average reward, we just need to do infinite steps. But yeah, empirical data suggests doing infinite steps takes quite a long time. So we need to come up with something else. Um, there actually is uh, another thing that uh, a stopping criterion that makes this work that basically tells you oh, I've, I have these values, and now I know that, well, I'm maybe not exactly at the solution, but you're like arbitrarily close. So we can kind of get an, um, we can kind of get an epsilon optimal solution from finite iteration. Uh, this is all known, and this known stopping criterion only works under the assumption that all the states in the MDP have the same optimal value. Uh, in general, this assumption doesn't hold. And there, yeah, so this is also where the, the disproven conjecture comes in. The, um, there was a conjecture stopping criterion for the general case, but unfortunately, it doesn't work, so we don't have a value iteration that solves this problem in the general case. As an example, uh, let's just go back to, to, to our, yeah, to the robot. Uh, we see that, yes, indeed, different states have different optimal values. So, for example, here, this, this idle state after backflip is, has an optimal value of 10, because, yeah, here you get 10 on average. Down here, when it's on the floor, you just get 5 on average. So, yeah, you have different values. But the thing you can observe is that states that are kind of connected have the same optimal value. So, these two guys here have the same optimal value. Why is this the case? This is basically the key concept to the to the solution here. Um, so this these connected states are actually just max. Max are parts of the state space in which you can remain infinitely for infinite time if you decide to do so. In a nutshell, and all the states in the Mac have the same optimal value, which is I think quite easy to see because uh, suppose that some state has some optimal value then by definition of a Mac, you can just go there in finite time, almost surely, and then do whatever, it need, whatever needs to be done to get the optimal uh, value there. Okay, so now we know 
oh, we can actually compute values for each Mac. This isn't the whole solution, but half of it. What's only missing now is, hey, how can we go from, we have values for each Mac to what's the global value? And, well, we came up with a simple solution, and uh, that is to, we first approximate the value in each Mac or determine the value of each Mac, then collapse all of these Macs into representative states, and then solve a weighted reachability problem, which I'm going to explain, uh, which I'm going to explain in a, again with the example. So, what are we doing? We determine the max. We, um, oops, we compute the values in each. Okay, so up here we have a value of four because the best you can do while remaining in here is just yeah, continue dancing. Down here it's the ten. Okay, and the best value here again is just. Yeah, having the five. Okay. Then we collapse them. This is a construction known as the, the, uh, the MEC quotient. Uh, we have taken the existing definition and modified it slightly to, to get, like make things a bit more, a uh, uh, bit faster. But in, yeah, in essence, you just collapse these MACs, uh, have one state representing them, give the state the value of the MAC, and then you try to compute weighted reachability. Weighted reachability in this context just means, well, what is the maximum value I can get to in, uh, on average? So here, we do that. We see that, for example, this guy here, it had a value of 4 before, but it can actually go to 5 and something by actually stopping to dance, and there should be an F, sorry, um, and trying to go over, over there to these guys. Okay. So... Then you look at this and think, oh yeah, there, there comes the dreaded question, does it scale? It kind of gives reasonable results on models with, say, a million or 10 million states, but real models tend to be larger than that, way larger. And they tend to be even too large to fit into memory, so we immediately get time or memouts. And now the question is, can we do better somehow? Okay. Uh, we made two observations. Uh, the first observation is that uh, consider Tom Industries now released a new improved version of uh, of the robot where the dancing subroutine is like really super advanced and there are a million of states in there. Uh, same with they, they actually bother to implement uh, what happens after the backflip and there are 10 million states after there too. And the first observation is that if we somehow can get a bound on what's happening inside this uh, dancing subroutine, it doesn't matter what, what's the precise value. So if it is, has a value, an average reward of 4 or 4.1 or 3.9, it doesn't matter because down here we get something better. Okay? So the first question is, can we avoid unnecessarily precise computations? We don't need the precise value here. The second question is, well, what happens after the backflip actually really doesn't matter because it happens with so little probability that if our like if the the precision we want to have is li uh, like reasonable enough, then we don't actually need to compute what's happening over there at all. So we don't need to look at the states at all, given that we have some kind of upper bound on the reward you can get. So if the user tells us, or if I say, well, the most entertainment I can get is. 20 or something per time unit or per step, then I don't need to bother to look at what's over there because I can only get 20 at most and it happens with such little chance that, yeah, why should I look at it? And so we made this observation and spoiler alert, yes, we can do this. And we're using for this statistical methods and ideas from machine learning. Uh, the idea if more or less described as bounded real-time dynamic programming. That was mentioned before already. Uh, the only assumption that we make is that you kind of get an upper uh, bound on the reward, which is, I think, a reasonable assumption. So what do we do? Um, we basically we initialize lazily. We give all the states a faithful upper and lower bound. Uh, which is also related to, to the um, ideas presented previously. Uh, we just initialize it with uh, zero and the given upper bound. Okay, and then we, we yeah, this is where the statistical methods come in. We sample a path 
and then we somehow update the values along this path by something by a method I'll explain in, in on the next slide. And we'll just terminate when the bounds are close enough in, in the initial state. So basically where we want to know what the um, what the values are. Okay. So the difference between the bounds kind of give us a level of uncertainty. If a state has high difference between the bounds, we have high uncertainty. If it's very, very close, like 10 to the minus 6, we kind of know what the value of this state is. And now the idea from machine learning basically just is let this uncertainty guide our sampling, because this kind of balances then exploration versus exploitation. If we are unsure about some region, we explore it. If we're sure that it's bad, we don't explore it. And now we have this bounds per state, and we need to update them. The very high-level idea, this is actually where kind of the, the central part of the paper lies, um, is a bit tricky, but the high-level idea is yeah, that you sample paths, this gives you a, a sub-model. Basically, you, you, you haven't seen all the states, you just, you just memorize the states you have seen so far. Uh, in the sub-model, you repeatedly determine max, collapse them, and in these max, you approximate the values using the previous approach. And um, whenever the algorithm decides, hey, this region looks interesting, then you refine the values. And yeah, you kind of, yeah, wh when the Mac has promising upper bounds. But yeah, it's kind of tricky. So if you're interested in this, just look at the paper. Uh, I don't have time to go into that, unfortunately. So yeah, now that's the theory. Now give you the numbers. The numbers are, I think, quite good. We compare to the only tool we found doing uh, mean payoff, which is multi-gain. It's actually built for um, multi-objective multi-gain, so the comparison isn't completely fair. But as you see here, we just completely beat it in, in any reasonable model. And we also improved the implementation a bit to get these numbers down to more like, say, 50 and 80 or something. OK. And now here comes the cool thing, this uh, machine learning guided approach, which is we call ODV, on-demand value iteration. And the most interesting model is the zero-conf model, uh, which has, in this instance, like 4 million states. But to compute a, um, pr a value precise to 10 to the minus 6, we only needed to explore like 1,000 states of this million. And yeah, we needed 16 seconds to do that. In a new implementation, we got this down to roughly a second or something. Uh, so it really works for some models. For other models, it's the same as, as the previous approach. It just depends on the topology. If the whole region of the state space is interesting, you have to explore everything. There's no way around it. OK. So in summary, what have we done? We've shown that uh, value iteration does not work out, uh, out of the box in general. We provided a simple solution, which is a divide and conquer approach. Um, this already beats existing methods by a huge margin. Uh, even better, we use machine learning to identify important parts and then focus our, our um, computation on that. And this is kind of the, the key takeaway note uh, I want to give in this talk is you can actually use machine learning for verification without sacrificing um, precision. You just use machine learning in some way to identify the important thing and then, then do what, whatever is the, the right thing to do there. And well, the uh, further work, more sophisticated machine learning. I mean, this is kind of a, a simple machine learning idea. They have that for, for a long time. Maybe you can use some kind of neural network, something to do a bit more interesting stuff. OK, that's all, folks. Uh, so. Now it's time to ask questions or go for lunch. Your choice. <laughs> Everyone is blown away. I, I was wondering um, about that dancing robot. So yeah. <laughs> the, the reward for successful backflip it was large but it was not Wait. Uh, let me go back to the to the model yeah. and we can uh, point at it uh, 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 where is it, it. there yeah. okay uh, that it was large but not by an order of magnitude compared yeah. to others so what happens if it's by several order of magnitudes uh, which reward 
the, for, for doing successful duct sleep? Um, then, yeah, you basically, then you have to, you have to look at this, uh, uh, at this um, uh, option. Like, you have to explore it and say, or maybe you also just know that the, the upper bound on, on, the, on the rewards is very rough, then, um, yeah, you would have to explore that region. There is no way around it. So, um, in a moment. Here you also see that basically this value propagates into this optimal value by, by this factor, of course. And now if this is 10 million, then of course the optimal value in here will be uh, 100,000 or something. Okay. Other questions? Let's thank the speaker again.